All right, everybody, welcome back to this week's uh, CBD Association weekly update. We're super excited this week to have a very special guest with us, special because she's awesome at what she does, and she's one of our dear friends. Kristen Adams of Beauty Brands Academy is with us. Uh, I, 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 I want to say you're a know-it-all. I know that's offensive sometimes, but you truly are a know-it-all when it comes to everything CBD and cosmetics, so we're super excited to have you this week. Um, in addition to all of the wonderful things she does, Kristen is our cosmetic industry advisor. She's been a tremendous resource and great advocate for us over the past couple of years, and we're excited uh, that she could spare some time to, uh, to come on. So Kristen, with that being said, uh, tell us a little bit about what you're doing right now with Beauty Brands. Thank you so much. Well, um, I'm Kristen, and I am a beauty brand builder. So my history and my background is in cosmetics for the last 17 years, and I have built beauty brands. I do a lot of work in the product development space. I've done over over 200 SKUs in natural beauty development and um, natural beauty products. And uh, over the last few years, I've gotten into cannabis and um, and that's how I met Matt through the CBD Association and have just uh, really enjoyed working with the CBD Association. And um, outside of the CBD Association, what I've been doing is working with beauty brands in the traditional beauty and cosmetic space, but a lot of them want to get into cannabis at some level. And a lot of that is with um, limited product launches with CBD. So that's kind of how Matt and I met at, uh, uh, at Industrial Hemp Summit a few years ago. And um, it, it's not only relegated to beauty brands though. Uh, processors wanna get involved, contract manufacturers in the cosmetic space wanna get involved in CBD and all the rare cannabinoids as well. And, um, and so it kind of spans, it's and raw material suppliers that have never traditionally sold cannabinoids also want to add cannabinoids to their catalog of raw materials. So I work with, I kind of act as a bridge between those two worlds, a, a translator. And um, yeah, so that, that's where I am. I have a consultancy called Satori Minds. And then I just launched Beauty Brand Academy, which is for product developers who, well, aspiring product developers who want to launch beauty brands. And this, they could include CBD or they could just be exclusive beauty brands. So those are all the things I'm doing right now. Yeah, so, and, and there's about a thousand other things that you're not yeah. telling people because you do everything. Uh, so I guess the first question I have, and you and I kind of talked about this earlier, is how has, you know, this industry when it comes to cannabis or specific cannabinoids changed since 2018, since the Farm Bill? Like what's the evolution you've seen in the cosmetic industry since then? It's Loaded gone, question, I know, but. Yeah, yeah, it's gone in a great direction. So, so with the farm bill um, and, and even building up to the farm bill, there was the um, medical and rec side that was already including, and a little bit on the CBD side, already including cannabis ingredients in top, what they call topicals, which right. are cosmetics. <laughs> and uh, and um, so they were including them just as the, um, as the, the cannabinoid or the terpene in these base cells. So they were, they were very, um, they were very simple products and simple ingredients. A lot, if they were in the CBD space, it was just a serum, which was basically a, an oil carrier that had some CBD of some concentration in it. And they slapped a label on it and called it a beauty product, and that was it. <laughs> So it wasn't very, it wasn't very sophisticated, let's say it wasn't, and it didn't really, it didn't really walk or talk like a traditional cosmetic it, um, in terms of branding and in terms of just sophistication of the packaging. And since then there has been just this huge surge in products and new entrepreneurs and new brands that have come on the scene that are actually creating gorgeous, sophisticated product lines with CBD and, and also on the medical and rec side, but everything from person like lubricants all the way up to lipsticks it's the entire gamut of personal care products with yeah and that, that's a good point too because i remember when you know we first met qu pretty quickly after the farm bill passed have you seen and you talked about the sophistication of the industry over time yeah. in the absence of some kind of regulatory framework which is what i always harp on do you find that companies are still kind of flying by the seat of the pants or do you think that they do companies feel like there's more guidance out there or is it still just a we're going to enter this market and see what happens. So 
the traditional cause most of the traditional cosmetic companies your largest cosmetic companies the most well known the ones that you see in um, most frequently in Sephora Ulta the drugstores they are still sitting on the sidelines because right. if there is uh, and I think you would agree but please, correct me if I'm wrong still a gray area right Matt yes I would yeah. call it the, the darkest shade of gray but go ahead yeah <laughs> you're right you're so, right so uh, I, I keep wishing for it to be lighter and lighter, but yeah, it's still some shade of gray. Um, and all the traditional cosmetic companies, most of them are sitting on the sidelines waiting for FDA clarity. For them, there is not enough FDA clarity. Are they playing with CBD and other cannabinoids in R&D? Most assuredly. Are they actually launching many products with them? No. They, what, they are keeping their eye on the smaller brands, seeing who gets shot down, what cream rises to the top, there'll probably be acquisitions. But um, on the traditional cosmetic side, they're not doing much in terms of launches. Yeah, because you don't have to, right? Like your L'Oreal, your Revlons, like they have enough revenue streams from other products. Like they don't need to ride yeah. this wave like the folks that are just putting out CBD topicals and that's their only source of yeah. business. It's not worth it for them to risk anything. They'll just wait for some a, a small guy to risk it, stick their neck out, see if it works. And then once there's more FDA clarity, they'll just acquire that company, most likely. But for the small entrepreneurs and the scrappy entrepreneurs, like this is a super fun space to be in because it's changing quickly. There's, it's very dynamic. It is a new frontier for an entrepreneur, like at heart, this is an awesome place to be. And you see a lot of entrepreneurs that have never launched a personal care product before launching brands and products with CBD in them and um, taking all the risks <laughs> um, and, they are doing that without any understanding of regulatory at any level. That's a good point that you raised. And, and I think that, you know, this is obviously we're focused on cosmetics today, but it, it probably mm -hmm. applies across the entire CBD market right. is that big companies are just waiting and seeing how these smaller companies do. Yeah. And they're going to pick, pick which one they want to acquire. Yeah. So put yourself in the position. I know you've worked with major cosmetic companies. You've also worked with small companies. So is that the goal for the smaller businesses in this space is to just do well, survive this regulatory void and sell to L'Oreal or to Revlon or something like that? I think a lot of them, that is the goal. I mean, if they yeah. could have an exit, a multi-million dollar exit, uh, I think many of them would take that option. But, but off brands, entrepreneurs build brands all the time as legacy brands that they want to have for the rest of their lives. So um, going circling back to your regulatory point, whether they are a, a brand that wants to sell to a large traditional cosmetic company or not, they can't, they can't affect, look like an attractive brand unless they have all their ducks in a row. And that also includes regulatory. Uh, so yeah. there, are, there are a lot of boxes to check uh, before they can actually look attractive. So yeah, well, so brings us to the next point is, you know, you know the space better than anybody. If I'm a large company, with something stuck in R&D, just kind of waiting it out, or if I'm a smaller company that's, I'm in there and I'm swimming in the waters hoping for the best, where do you see it going future? Because we don't have any kind of timeline on a regulatory, like the rule book's not coming out tomorrow, right? So <laughs> I'm sorry, but so do you think that it's gonna to continue to be this way for the foreseeable future? Or so if I'm an investor in CBD cosmetics, what is what does the landscape look like for me? If you're an investor, there are so many gorgeous brands out there right now. Right. They're, they're doing a lot of incredible work and, um, and more are coming online every day. A lot of those brands that investors are looking at will have some great social media, tra um, social media numbers. They'll have a great audience. They could have a very loyal following, but they probably don't know a lot about what they're doing. Um, okay. Just from the, uh, like have the organizational perspective or, um, they could use some mentorship, and which, which, it, which, is, which is a beautiful place for investors to be in, even if they're not ready to acquire because they can come in and they can really support these, these entrepreneurs to build to the next level. Uh, it's, it is a difficult place to be in when you are building a brand and you have never done it before. You don't, you've never done it in this space before. Uh, so to come in as an investor and not just sit on the sidelines, but actually be actively involved in building strategically and positioning brands, I think is, um, uh, adds a lot of value to these brands. Are, and, and are you seeing, are you seeing a lot of that? Are you seeing like 
you said we we said on the sidelines. Are we seeing people stepping over and giving a pep talk to some of these small companies? Are we seeing that kind of level of engagement? I'm yeah, you're seeing a lot, uh, all of it across the yeah. board. Yeah, it really it really depends on the background of the investor and and why they're motivated to get involved in CBD and you know it, some some of them really get involved because they really believe in in the plant they really believe in the mission they really believe in in how deeply it can transform our country for the good um, from farming all the way through the value chain and there are others that just want to you know flip a flip a fast yeah fast and we see that a lot you see you see folks that are like that you know, see the projections of revenue for cannabis over the next five years and they want to get in however they can. Yeah. And then you have other folks that really understand the plant, what it can do, and they're coming at it from a, a different perspective. And I'm, I'm assuming at some point those two worlds are going to collide. Right. And it's not just investors coming after brands in the cosmetic space. It's also, there are a lot of raw material suppliers that are taking cannabinoids um, and doing some sophisticated raw material ingredients with cannabinoids right now. So there are many levels to play at um, by getting into CBD and other cannabinoids in this space. So. so yeah, the one thing that you and I have over the years, which I could say over the years now, that we've always gone back and forth on and, and talked about is just how, you know, we have this patchwork regulatory scheme for the United States. Some states are, you know, you can go into the jurisdiction and know exactly what you can and can't do. Others are completely, you know, it's an unknown and then we're waiting on the, the federal stuff. How is the cosmetic industry grappling with the international aspect of this? Because obviously there's no other CBD industry like more equipped and ready to be injected on a large international base. So I was wondering your, uh, your input on that. So traditional cosmetic companies have a challenge, uh, what's called harmonizing between all of the countries around the world because every many countries have their own unique regulatory, like all their unique laws around how they deal with cosmetics and what you can and can't do, how the ingredients have to look on the boxes. Like it can be very different by country. So in traditional cosmetic companies, there are whole careers and whole departments around regulatory and making sure that when they have a product launch, they, they do it in a very mindful way to make sure that it can be sold around the world and they're not selecting ingredients that are or in even percentages that are not allowed in certain countries and so when you when you inject cannabinoids and cbd into that conversation it it is another um it's another puzzle that they have to solve before they can effectively say okay this this makes sense for us to launch a product right now um, without all so many regulatory hurdles. So when you hear, when you hear of countries opening up, like, you know, you hear Mexico about to legalize, you hear the EU dropping, you know, new regulations and things like right. that. Do you think the big companies in the United States that are waiting on the sidelines in the US that they're already, that do they have to overcome the hurdle of US regulations before they get fully involved in the international market? Or do you think they're already looking at it all as one big, one big playing field? Well, they're, they're looking at the U.S. first. It's a huge market, but right. um, if it, if they can only launch a product in the U.S., it's less likely to fly if they can't really hit their major markets. But um, I think that's a that's a per a per brand decision, uh, and we've seen some brands, Polish Choice, for example, they're they're an online brand, but they're very well known and respected, and um, they just launched two this this past year two CBD products. Uh, which were really well received and, um, and, and that was nationwide. So, but they are an online brand. They don't have uh, in-store presence, which does make a difference. And the shift with coronavirus to, um, right. to being DTC direct to consumer, I think really has created a boon for the CBD industry in general to move more product without the, without the cumbersomeness of selling in individual jurisdictions. What would you say to that <laughs> from a legal perspective? I'd say it's a mess. I mean, I think that goes to kind of what my next question was, is as you know, CBD associations were run by political professionals. You know, we aren't folks that were rooted in cannabis in our background. It's we understand how to advocate, lobby local governments, you know, you know, get scientific research in front of legislators and regulators. Um, but the one thing that we've noticed is that there's not been such a there's not been a sufficient 
advocacy campaign, or I, I guess I should say a united advocacy campaign in this space right now. And so I know there are other trade associations out there in the cosmetic space. Do you feel that like, you know, other groups or that the industry as a whole is being as aggressive in getting uniform standards as they should be? Well, I think that the CBD Association is uniquely positioned to do that. And that's why I've aligned with you guys. <laughs> so uh, uh, I'm very appreciative of all the different associations that are out there because the, the, more, the more kinetic energy we have in the right direction at every single level of the conversation, the better. But specific to what you're talking about and the advocacy that you're talking about, I think that the CBD Association is uniquely positioned, especially with the background of the team to, um, to move the needle on that. Yeah, and I, and, it's yeah, and I don't, yeah, and I don't say that to knock any, any, any group at all. I just think um, what you and I have come across when we've, you know, we've appeared at conferences together, you know, yeah. when we would present regulatory professionals for major companies, like, hey, this is an issue popping up in this state and mm -hmm. they're wholly unaware that it's happening. Yeah. And it's, it seems like there's a disconnect in the cosmetic industry specifically between the regulatory professionals for a company and the business marketing and research and development professionals within a company that they're not, for, for whatever reason, they're not, the goals don't seem aligned because I, I, it's been too many times that we've been on calls or presented to folks and it's, you know, we're telling them something for the first time they've ever heard it. Mm -hmm. And as a regulatory professional, you'd expect them to know like what's going on. Uh, I mean, they're, they're, they juggle a lot of different rules. Regulatory is not right. a feat, um, especially as a creative coming from that side to even think about juggling that many rules just makes my head spin. So for them, ca cannabis, CBD is a very small piece of their concern, exactly. like super small. Exactly. And I know even for the, the largest contract manufacturers that run products for the, some of the most well-known brands, they have in-house cannabis task forces. You know, we've spoken to them and, and they, are, they are very excited about CBD. They are ready to use CBD in their products. They have, been, they, have, they have been dedicated to making sure that they understand regulatory issues with CBD. And yet it's still like such a small piece of their focus. A lot of things fall through the cracks. As you, as you know, with some of the issues that have like risen and been almost alarm issues. And then for one reason or another might or might not have come to fruition but they, they didn't even get on their radar. Right. Which and that's the other really thing. And, yeah. And it's not a knock on anybody. I, I, I'm not trying to say that. I think that no. the one thing is like, there's never been an quote unquote ingredient like this. It's like almost, I know. We're, watching, we're watching tobacco in reverse, right? To where people were able to smoke tobacco for hundreds of years. No one, you know, really cared about the health effects of it until later. And now it's like, everyone's like, well, before we're going to allow this product, everyone to ingest it, to put it on their skin, whatever. We need yeah. to know every detail about health. And that's impossible for if you're a, you know, a 30 year old regulatory official for a cosmetic company, it's got to be a nightmare because honestly, the answer when you're approached by your business development people is, I don't know. And right. that's an okay. And, that, and that's a very valid answer right now. There's nothing yeah. like, there's nothing wrong with that. That is a valid answer. Yeah. 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 So where did they go for their resources? I am we, we've been pulled into traditional cosmetic compliance conferences to talk about the dynamics that are happening in the CBD world, um, just, just so they can wrap their heads around it, get more information, talk to you, um, Morgan, the other, the, the CBD association team to get more understanding. But you really need, if you're going to play in this space, you need to have someone that's continuously kind of like on call and in the loop, um, tapped into that part of the product development because during a product development cycle, the marketing may have a great idea about having a CBD product. Um, they bounce it off their innovation and tech, their like scientific team. They right. develop a product, but it can't get anywhere until regulatory signs off on it. So, um, so that's literally where the buck stops. Right. Like it doesn't and, even start actually. Yeah. Okay. And unfortunately, unfortunately our, our governments haven't quite caught up to being able to provide that information yet. And so no. It's, a real, it's a real quagmire for companies. I totally yeah. get it. Yeah. And unfortunately, there are a lot of, um, so there are the raw material suppliers, there are the contract manufacturers that run most of the products, most, a lot of the brands that the most well-known brands, you think they're, those products are run by the brand, but they're actually 
run and, and produced by these contract manufacturers. And a lot of these contract manufacturers won't even get into CBD because they don't want to touch the regulatory aspect of it uh, because there's just so much on the line. And um, I think that's really unfortunate. We know which way this is going to go, don't we? Right. Do we know yes, which way we this do. is going to go? We do know, <laughs> yeah. In, in, so, in, X, in X amount of years, this conversation is completely obsolete. It's going to be laughable. Will, yeah, it'll be laughable. Yeah. So, but yeah, you're right. Yeah. So I, I just, if there's anything we can do to join together to accelerate this, at the end of the day, like CBD uh, and cannabinoids and cannabis in general, it is an ingredient. It's, it's a highly stigmatized for no good reason, especially if it doesn't have any significant amount of THC ingredient. Right. That is incredible in certain, in, cert, in certain products where it's appropriate. There is more and more information coming. Gene markers, for example, um, which does genomic testing, has been doing some awesome testing on CBD with all the powerful can, effects it can have, even topically, which I know has been uh, a point of question for many people. And, and I think we just need to do everything we can to move us past this point, this laughable I point in history. <laughs> I agree. And your point's well taken. Uh, it's an ingredient. The issue is just going to be whether FDA, USDA, or the EU or whoever says that we need to regulate this ingredient across all industries yeah. differently and uniquely for food and beverage versus cosmetics or animal products, or do we treat it the same for everything? Right. And, you know, not to, you know, bash them at all. It's just, they've never had that question before. So right. it's, it's a, it's a good problem to have. Like you said, hopefully this is a problem we can laugh at in a few years, but yeah, I think cosmetics are going to be interesting because you're, I say you as if you represent all of cosmetics, but like you're the least regulated <laughs> industry out of all the ones that's using CBD, yet yeah. you're, you're put on the, you know, on the battlefront against re significant regulation just because of a product's relation to cannabis. So it's a, it's a unique position that cosmetic professionals find themselves in. Yeah. And I'm actually, um, I'm working more and more with, um, biosynthetic cannabinoids, rare cannabinoids as well. So that is, that is a whole different wrinkle and angle that's entered the conversation right. uh, with CBG and CBC and CBN and all of the, the rare cannabinoids that are now being, um, being produced through fermentation. So they're not even plant touching. And how, what does that mean to this conversation? And, and, then, and then we forget about all the IP. There's, there's so yeah. many people with patents around CBD right now and so many different angles and how does that factor into this conversation? Yeah, um, that's where you blow by me in the race. I know enough of the science to be dangerous and you know about infinitely more than I do, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good point that you raise, you know, even the simple things as simple as like Delta eight, like how are the FDA going to treat Delta eight products versus Delta nine products? Yeah. And it's just something like not people, a lot of folks think that just figuring out CBD hemp, are above 0.3 THC is the answer. Once you start entering the synthetics and materials into this conversation, there's a whole new level of legislation and regulation that needs to get passed. And so I don't know what the timeline is for when this is all gonna get figured out, but the, the controversy, I guess, for lack of a better term, is much larger than just is CBD a legal product because of the science that goes into it. Right, so we play in this gray area and you help us figure it out. Yeah. So can you, I was going to ask if you could just fix all of this for us. That would be really fantastic. We'd really appreciate it. Me fix it? Yeah. Just fix it all right now. I We're thought good. that's what lawyers did. <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess my, my last question is uh, what's your, can we give some people some hope? What's your optimism of, at least in the cosmetic space of having some kind of clear regulatory pathway uh, coming forward? Like, when do you think the big boys are going to get involved in uh, putting products on shelves? Well, they, I, from everything I know, every, all the chatter I've heard, um, and just what I, what I believe to be true is that many of them are already involved at some level. And most okay. of it is in R&D, or they have some consultants off on the side or something that's not directly attached to their internal R&D team that is working on some kind of CBD product or um, cannabinoid product. And uh, the, the thing about large companies, they have the burden of proof in a, at a different level than a scrappy 
startup beauty business that ha has a CBD product. If they make any claim at all or say any, like, anything at all, they have the burden of proof of safety, regulate, making sure they're completely buttoned up from a regulatory perspective. For any claims, they also have to prove it. And not only do they want to make, they want to have claims, but they also want to make sure that they can prove them because even though there have been a number of other players that have already come out, when they come out, they want to do it with a solid claim. This product can reduce the appearance of fine lines and wrinkles by X percent, or this, you know, this ingredient reduces um, irritation and itchiness or something. They're going to make some kind of claim around that product and they're going to have to prove it with clinicals. So, so they are right. extremely deliberate and uh, uh, in comparison to your scrappy startup uh, and they pour a lot more money and time into their product development because they know if anyone's neck is on the chopping block, if it's done wrong, it's theirs. It's not going to be a little, a little beauty brand that's flying under the radar that has no social impact or significance if it gets a FDA slap or an FDA letter right. or a letter. And yeah. so was that me shedding like light and joy on the situation? <laughs> Basically, everyone's doing it. Everyone, <laughs> tell your parents, everyone's already doing it. Yeah. Um, and um, it's, it's just a matter of time. I think that I believe in the power of cannabinoids. I deeply, deeply believe in the power of cannabinoids and in cannabis in general. And I, cosmetics is meant to, to cleanse and decorate. And so that's why whenever you launch a cosmetic product, there's very few claims you can make. And if you make them, you have to be very careful about how you make them. So if you're using an active ingredient that is actually doing something, like it is shielding you from the skin, it is reducing your acne or, or, um, or healing a wound, or if it's, if it's helping a cold sore, if it's doing anything that is is shifting the nature of your skin or doing something active, then it's considered an OTC, an over-the-counter drug. So that's your antiperspirants, your, ac your acne medication, your topicals, your, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's it, your foot creams. All, all of those products are actually over-the-counter drugs. They have this little panel on the back sunscreens, the, the monograph. And I think that's like in the long term, I think that's where, CBD over a certain percentage will be placed as an OTC yeah. um, because it works. I mean, I, I don't say that because I want more regulatory. No, I know. <laughs> regulatory I know. like frameworks around this, but but because I think it, it's actually doing something, it actually works. I think the data will prove out eventually, uh, especially especially with new genomic testing, like what Gene Markers is doing, that there is some effect happening on the skin just like when we take it internally, especially if we have damaged skin, inflamed skin, if we have specific skin issues. So that immediately pushes it into the OTC category. And that's, I think that's where it's gonna stay. So some of the largest cosmetic contract manufacturers, I don't know if they did this intentionally or unintentionally, but they have, they have approached CBD when they've taken it in as an ingredient and they handled it as an ingredient, they've approached it as a, as as an OTC ingredient. And so when a contract manufacturer is handling those ingredients and going through the documentation process when they make an OTC, like a sunscreen, a deodorant, an acne product, they have to document and they have to, they have additional steps to their processes. And they've taken their cannabinoids and their CBD products through that same process. And I think that is the smartest thing anyone can do at this point is to get in front of it. Yeah, So it's, it's a good work. point. Because. because it works. But I think you're right. I think, I mean, I know you're right. And you know, you're right that at some point down the road, it's going to be that we're just going to look on the back of a product, be it a cosmetic or a food or beverage item. And the nutritional ingredients is going to have a column for THC level. Like that's really where all this is going to go at some point. And so now it's just a matter of ironing out the details. Yeah. Uh, in instead of trying to discern like how many megs are in this bottle. Right. It, 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 that's not even the way actives are talked about in cosmetics. So there's still this disconnect between, between the way CBD products are labeled and the way 
cosmetic buyers look at active ingredients and look for concentrations of, of a certain active, like hyaluronic acid, like niacinamide, like vitamin C in their products. So, so we have, we have so much we can do in this space still. It's so yeah. baby space. We have a lot to accomplish, but a lot of work to do to get it done. So yeah. on that note, thank you. Folks, check out Beauty Brand Academy. We're gonna force Chris and me back on here many more times. You'll hear from her again. Truly one of the best in the business when it comes to cannabinoids and and uh, in the cosmetic industry. As always, our, uh, our weekly disclaimer, nothing Chris and I have said today is legal advice. If you're wanting to inject a product into a particular market, we recommend you uh, you consult with local counsel. But Kristen, this was great. It's good to see you. I wish we would all be in person once again, but hopefully we all get vaccinated and we can see each other soon. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it, Matt. Thanks. See you next time.